We would like to invite everyone to please rise and join us in the singing of the Philippine National Anthem, which will be immediately followed by our prayer. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this year's Kagitingan Historical Webinar Lecture 2022, A Filipino Perspective of Heroism and Valor. I am Felicia Lois Lanya. And I am Hannah Costas, and we are your hosts for today. Now, before anything else, allow me to acknowledge the presence of the following. Department of National Defense Secretary Delphine N. Lorenzana, PIVAO Administrator Yusek Ernesto G. Carolina, PIVAO Deputy Administrator Asik Raul Z. Caballes, NHCP Chairperson Dr. Rene Escalante, PVB Vice President Mr. Mike Villarreal, Mao Samad, Samad FTES Administrator Mr. Francis Initorio, VSC President Dr. Cesar P. Pobre, Dr. Archie B. Rezos from the University of Santo Tomas, Dr. Jose Romel B. Hernandez from the De La Salle University and Dr. Marilyn Arangales from the Lyceum of the Philippines University, Manila. Also, we would like to extend our gratitude to the following institutions for partnering with us in this webinar series. Armed Forces of the Philippines, OJ3, Department of Education, Commission on Higher Education, Department of Tourism, National Commission for Culture and the Arts, National Youth Commission, National Historical Commission of the Philippines, Veterans Federation of the Philippines, Philippine Information Agency, Girl Scouts of the Philippines, Boy Scouts of the Philippines, Filipino American Memorial Endowment, and Defenders of Bataan and Corregidor Incorporated. And right about now, we have about 
150 participants here in Zoom. Now, for those who are unable to pre-register, we are currently being broadcasted via Facebook Live on the official Facebook page of the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office. Before we officially begin the program, here are some of the reminders for all of us. In case there are lags, just stay on and wait for it to load again. Zoom attendees are on mute to avoid background noise. If you have questions, you may use the message box for Zoom attendees or use the comment section on the Facebook live stream. After the webinar, the participants who registered in this webinar are encouraged to answer the evaluation form. The link will be sent on their email. Now, during our last episode, we were joined by four resource speakers. First, by Dr. Jose Victor Z. Torres, who told us the story of the order of four players in the Philippines during World War II. He was followed by Ms. Naomi Himera, who presented her paper titled Kababaihan ng Rebellion to Balaha. During our afternoon session, Ms. Desiree Benipayo discussed and highlighted the contributions of our amazing Filipino women heroes during the resistance. For our last speaker, Mr. John D. C. Candelaria, shared to us his paper with the title Dainty Hands Do Useful Work Depicting Filipino Women in Japanese Wartime Propaganda. Now, for those of you who wish to watch the previous episode of our webinar series, the recorded lectures may still be viewed at the official Facebook page and YouTube account of the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office. This webinar episode will be dedicated to the growing discussion of the unknown local histories of World War II in the Philippines. With new methods in local historiography, developed through years of research and discussion of our historians within their circle and the international communities, a renewed enthusiasm for the study of local history is now taking place in historical research. And with that, our lineup of speaker of resource speakers for this morning session include Dr. Marcelino Macapinlac Jr., who will be presenting his lecture, The Santo Tomas Internment Camp in Digital Sources. Next is Mr. Jose Matthew P. Luga, who will be giving us the history of Benguet during the Second World War and another lecture about the little-known story of Muntinupa during the war will be given by Mr. Michael Anihelo Tabuyan. And for our afternoon session, we will be welcoming Dr. Kirby C. Alvarez, who will speak to us about the important events took place in Malabon during the World War II. Mr. Jose Alberto L. Jimenez III will give his lecture about the local history of Calamba from 1942 to 1945. And lastly, Mr. Ruben Jeffrey A. Asuncion, will share his historical notes on Novaliches in North Caloocan during the Second World War. So without further ado, let us begin our program with an opening message from the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office Administrator under Secretary Ernesto G. Carolina. I wish to greet our... Uh Partners uh, from the uh, academe, Mr. Uh, Wogi uh, Pakala, President of uh, the Kalaokan Historical and uh, Cultural Studies, Professor Jose Romel B. Uh, Hernandez, Chairperson of uh, the Rosal University Department of History. I wish to greet also Dr. Uh, Marcelino Macapinlac, Associate uh, Professor at uh, the De La Salle University, Dr. Kirby Alvarez from uh, the University of uh, the Philippines, uh, Diliman, Mr. Jose Matthew uh, Luga from uh, the UP Baguio, Mr. Uh, Michael Anihelo Tabuyan from, uh, also from uh, UP uh, Diliman, Mr. Jose Alberto Jimenez from uh, the Centro Escolar uh, University, Mr. Ruben Jeffrey Asuncion, from uh, UP Los Baños, other uh, attendees, uh, friends, ladies, and gentlemen. A pleasant day to everyone. I'm pleased to welcome uh, all of you in the fifth uh, session of uh, the Kagitingan Webinar Lectures which will uh, delve uh, further 
into the Second World War in the Philippines. The Second World War in the Philippines was fought by the Allied uh, forces and uh, Filipino guerrillas with a uh, unity of purpose to liberate the Philippines from the clutches of the Japanese Imperial Army. And these men and women uh, from different backgrounds and uh, upbringing fought together shoulder to shoulder against the invaders. However, the narrative of the Second World War in the Philippines is dominated by stories from uh, the American perspective, obscuring the actual role and contributions of Filipinos in liberating our country. More so, the efforts of our uh, Filipino heroes during the Japanese uh, occupation were uh, barely recorded, as many Filipino journalists and uh, scholars uh, you know, abandoned their uh, uh, vocation and uh, looked for uh, other means to feed their families and avoid the prying eyes of uh, the invading forces. Production of writing materials were also uh, discontinued and uh, archival documents, manuscripts, and publications at uh, the National Library were also burned and destroyed during the liberation of Manila. The destruction of hundreds of thousands of documents meant loss of national and cultural heritage and decades of written history. As a means to counter this uh, problem brought by the war, then President Elpidio Quirino issued Executive Order Number uh, 486 to collect and compile historical data regarding our uh, barrios, towns, cities, and provinces. This is to retrieve some uh, semblance of memory of what transpired during and after the Japanese occupation uh, period from 1942 to uh, uh, the post-war period up to 1951. This is part serious uh, research work on local history as a means to supplement the national narrative. Studies in local uh, history flourished and untold the stories of the war unfolded in the provinces, towns, and barrios that were directly affected by the war. Thus, the heroism of our veterans began to take shape, and stories about their bravery started to be recorded. To some extent, this is what we are trying to uh, achieve today. We are holding this webinar to contribute to the growing discussion of the lesser-known local stories about the Second World War in the Philippines. We are bringing to light the war accounts from uh, Filipino primary uh, sources beyond what have been published by the Western media with Filipino historians and academicians delving uh, deeper to our own narratives we are given an opportunity to learn more about uh, our people's experiences, what they went through, and what they sacrificed to win our country's independence. There are much to be discovered yet about our veterans' efforts during the war, among which are uh, the significant contributions of the Filipino guerrillas such as the Hunters ROTC, the Markings Guerrillas, and uh, the Hukbung Bayan Laban Sahapon or Hukbalahap. Noteworthy to mention is the story of Captain Manuel Colaico, the first Filipino casualty during the Battle for Manila. On February 3, 1945, Allied forces arrived in Manila to begin its liberation efforts, 
the 8th Cavalry assigned to uh, liberate the uh, University of Santo Tomas internment camp, which housed uh, about 3,700 uh, Allied civilian internees, was led by two Filipino guerrillas, Captain Manuel Colaico and Lieutenant Josdado Guitinco. Captain Colaico, a Filipino newspaper man and a clandestine intelligence officer, became the first known Allied casualty in the city's liberation. He provided a uh, detailed map to the American troops, which uh, contains the specific location of uh, Japanese installations in the streets of Manila. And uh, unfortunately, at about nine in the evening, after a brief flurry of uh, resistance uh, from the Japanese guards, a uh, grenade explosion fatally wounded Captain Kolaiko. He died on the spot. But the intelligence information he provided on Japanese defensive installations proved invaluable in the liberation of thousands of prisoners of war in the UST internment camp. Captain Kolaiko's story is only one of the many Filipino narratives that need to be highlighted in our history lectures. Learning about uh, his story and all the other Filipino heroes during the war will not only help shift the historical narrative from the Western point of view to the Filipino perspective. It will also introduce to the Filipinos, especially to the youth, a multitude of Filipino heroes we can take inspiration from and be proud of. At this point, allow me to thank all our uh, lecturers for partnering with us in shedding light on the less known stories of World War II in the Philippines. Thank you as well to our participants for joining us again in the second to the last episode of uh, the Kagitingan Historical Webinar Lectures. I hope that you stay with us until the very end of this worthwhile undertaking. Thank you and welcome to the fifth episode of the Kagitingan Historical Webinar Lectures. Thank you very much, Under Secretary Carolina, for your welcoming message. This time, we will be joined by the President of the Caloocan Historical and Cultural Studies, Mr. Wogi T. Pakala, to deliver his message. Bumubuo, bumubuo, Veterans Affairs Office, sa mga pamunuan ng mga katuwang ng mga entidad at institusyon na nagtataguyod ng kagitingan webinar seri ngayong taon sa mga minamahal nating kasapi sa Kaloocan Historical and Cultural Studies Association, sa mga kasamang tagapagsalita ngayong araw at sa mga madlang nanonood, isang makasaysayan at mapagpalayang araw sa ating lahat. Ginugunita natin ngayong taon ng ikawalumpong anibersaryo ng kabayanihan ng ating mga ninuno noong panahon ng pananakop ng mga Hapones. Nasilayan natin ng isang kabanata na puno ng katapangan at kagitingan ng mga sundalong Pilipino at lumaon ang mga gerilyero na piniling isuko ang maginhawang buhay at hindi ipinagkanulo ang kanilang bayan, maipagtanggol lamang ang dangal at kalayaan ng minamahal na inang bayan. Bata pa lamang ay naikukwento na ng aking mga magulang at ng mga nakatatanda ang mga gunita ng lumipas na digmaan. Marahil bawat isa sa atin ay mayroong kanikanyang kwentong narinig ukol rito. Dahil ang bawat pamilyang Pilipino ay may sari-sariling karanasan ng kabayanihan, maging ng kasawi ang, uh, kasawihan sa mga panahong ito na naisasalin sa ating henerasyon. Sa ngayon, sa pagpupunyagi ng PIVAW, gayon din ang iba't ibang ahensya ng pamahalaan, 
Abot kamay na natin ang mga dokumentong nagbibigay buhay sa pag-aaral at pagpapayabong ng kasaysayan. Salamat sa Philippine Archives Collection ng PIVAO, naging madali ang pagsasaliksik ng sino mang may interes na alamin ang kabanatang ito na kwento ng ating bayan. Sa madilim ngunit magiting na kabanatang ito ng ating kasaysayan ay hindi sumuko ang ating mga ninuno. Ginawa nilang pansanggala nga ang sarili sa mga mananakop, maipagtanggol lamang ang ating bayan. Nasa atin na ang pagganap ng ating kukulin. Hindi tayo uh, susuko tulad nila sa kahit anumang banta at pagsubok na kinakaharap ng bayan. At lalong hindi hindi natin isusuko sa pagkalimot ang kanilang mga alaala na puno ng kagitingan, kabayanihan at pagkakaisa. Ang mga gunitang ito ang pinakamahalagang salik sa kasaysayan at sa pagkakakilanlan ng Pilipino. Ang kasaysayan ay hindi abstract o malayong ideya para sa simpleng mamamayan. Isinasabuhay natin ito. Tayo mismo ang nag-iipon ng mga kwento at naglalagak ng mga gunita upol sa atin at sa ating paligid, maging sa ating sariling pamayanan. Mas dama ang kasaysayan kung tinatalakay nito ang ating mga komunidad at naisasama sa mas malaking diskurso. Mas lumalawak ang pag-unawa natin sa kasaysayang pambansa kung may pagpapahalaga sa kasaysayang pampuok. Sa kanyang huling artikulo, nabanggit ng yumaong manunulat na si Epsonil Rosena, All our small towns have unique stories that separate them from other towns. It is for their historians and natives to discover this and to understand what makes them unique. It is important because it gives us not just a sense of place, but of time. The story of our towns bond us together into a sense of community and hopefully of shared responsibility and love for the place where we came from. And in this way, we truly become a nation. Kaya nga't narito at binabati natin ang mga nagpaunlak sa atin na magbahagi ng kanilang mga lektura na tumatalakay sa kwento ng iba't ibang mga lokalidad sa bansa noong ikalawang digma ang pandaigdig. Maraming salamat at isang kauspusong pagbati. Muli isang maganda at mapagpalayang araw sa ating lahat. Thank you very much, Mr. Pakala, for your message. Now, first in the lineup of our uh, of our speakers for today is a history professor from the La Salle University, Dr. Marcelino Macapinlac Jr. Dr. Mar Marcelino Macapinlac Jr. is an associate professor at the Department of the History, the La Salle University, Manila. He obtained his BA and MA in history from the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and his PhD in history from the University of Santo Tomas. He has also taught in the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, St. Scholastica College, Manila, Miriam College, University of the Philippines, Open University, University, and Ateneo de Manila University. Some of his works have been published in peer-reviewed journals, and his research interests include local history, oral history, historical geography, World War II, and the Japanese occupation of the Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Marcelino Macapinlac, Jr. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. The COVID-19 pandemic is a, a game changer in the conduct of historical research. It used to be the practice of many historians to move from one library or archive to another in search of uh, sources for their studies. For instance, a historian who chooses to do a study on the Japanese occupation of the Philippines, uh, specifically on the internment camps built by the Japanese to imprison allied civilians, had to visit various libraries and archives, such as the Philippine National Archives, the Archivo de la Universidad de Santo Tomas, the American Historical Collection in Ateneo de Manila University, and the main library of the University of the Philippines, uh, Diliman, to collect data. 
This usual routine had to be temporarily halted due to the current health emergency situation. For the past two years, the National Capital Region, where most libraries and archives in the Philippines are located, has been placed by the Interagency Task Force for the Management of Emerging Infectious Diseases, or IATF, under community quarantine or alert level, thereby altering the mobility of most historians, teachers, and students. Some adjustments had to be made by those who want to pursue their research projects. Among these is the manner of gathering historical information from both primary and secondary materials. Nowadays, one need not compromise his or her health through exposure to the coronavirus just to complete this task. Thousands of historical sources are readily available online. This paper intends to motivate historians and students of history, uh, particularly those who are engaged in reconstructing the history of Manila, to carry on their inquiries even during emergency situations such as pandemics. The discussion is divided into three parts the advantages and disadvantages of utilizing online resources are examined in the first part. The internet provides an immeasurable amount of historical sources. These are not only easily accessible, but easy to find as well by using a variety of search engines. This does not mean, however, that online resources are comprehensive. A large amount of historical sources remains to be digitized and made available in the World Wide Web. It is also difficult to figure out the accuracy and authenticity of the digitized version. The second part provides a description of the Santo Tomas internment camp as a physical space. It includes information on the camp's uh, physical structure such as its location, total area, population, the shanties that were built by the internees, and the sanitary facilities. The last part of the paper identifies and explains the challenges of life in an internment camp and how the internees uh, dealt with these difficulties. Shortages in the supply of food and other necessities, the poor health conditions inside the camp and the separation of some of the internees with their loved ones were some of the hardships that the internees had to endure. Diaries, interviews, news reports, and photographs were accessed to describe, analyze, and narrate the struggles and triumphs of the internees. In gearing up for this alternative way of uh, conducting research during the time of pandemic, it is important to familiarize the researcher with the pros and cons of using online resource materials. This part of the paper will uh, lay down some of its advantages and disadvantages. Historical sources, both primary and secondary, are now readily available and easily accessible online. There is an unlimited amount of information stored in cyberspace. The internet has also made historical records more accessible to researchers. Historians would also find themselves saving physical energy, time, transportation costs, and other miscellaneous expenses that visits to different physical libraries and archives would entail. Furthermore, online materials are more securely stored in the cyberspace compared to paper-based resources that are kept in a physical uh, space. Despite the many uh, historical research prospects that come with the use of online resources, it also comes with some disadvantages. For one, 
Since the historical research data is obtained from the internet, the researcher must at least invest on a stable internet connection and an electronic uh, device such as a laptop, a tablet, or other similar devices. Inability to secure these basic requirements would immobilize the researcher. It is also, also important to note that while John Tosh acknowledged the benefits of using the internet in historical research, he was also keen on its limitations. He admitted that available online materials are far from comprehensive. Also, suspicions on the veracity of the digitized version would consequently require verification of the original version. Meanwhile, Arlette Farge clearly expressed the high value that she placed on doing archival research. She argued that something is lost when the historian deprives himself of the chance to directly touch the originals, which to her is akin to uh, letting go of the historian's uh, closest chance to experience the past. There is also the difficulty of ascertaining the veracity of the document when many pieces of pertinent information about it seem to be missing. As for some non-history related concerns, uh, prolonged exposure to computer screen and other similar electronic devices could take its toll on the eyes of the researcher. While one may find a remedy in printing the materials, this would entail him additional costs. To have a clearer understanding of the developments inside the internment camp, it is important to put things in proper context. To achieve this, it is necessary to illustrate the physical conditions of the area during its establishment by the Japanese occupation forces as a prison camp of allied civilians. The camp newspaper titled the Liberation Bulletin provides a wide range of information about the physical structure of the camp, chronology of events, and statistical data. The total area of the camp, according to the paper, uh, Liberation Bulletin, was 195,545 square meters. It was divided into the following. Total garden areas, 30,126 square meters. Shanti area A, 17,620 square meters. Shanti area B, 8,605 square meters. Shanti area C, 17,490 square meters. And Shanti area D, 9,769 square meters. So this was uh, the total area of the STIC. We have here a map of the STIC. Okay. So for those of you who are familiar with the, the UST campus, okay, you can find here very familiar uh, uh, places uh, and streets like uh, España, Calle España. Uh, Calle Governor, uh, Governor Forbes, Calle Dapitan, and Calle Noval. So uh, within this uh, street, for, uh, so the UST campus is surrounded by these uh, uh, streets. Okay. So uh, you can find in this map the location of the Shanti areas. No? We have Shanti area A, Shanti area B. Uh, here, Shanti area C, and Shanti area D. Okay, and then we have here the banana grove and vegetable uh, garden uh, utilized by the internees. So we can compare this with the present day uh, campus map of the USD. Okay, so we have here España Boulevard, you know, formerly Calle España. Okay, Luxon Street or Calle Governor Forbes, um, Calle Pinoval or Pinoval Street, and then uh, Dapitan at the back of uh, 
the UST campus. Okay. So uh, what used to be uh, the shanty areas, okay, so are now uh, play, uh, parts of the campus where you can see uh, uh, big uh, or uh, tall buildings. Uh, so what used to be uh, shanty area A, okay, has already been built with uh, uh, with these buildings. Okay. Uh, Albertus Magnus. Okay. Then you have uh, formerly the Shanti area D, where you now have. Uh, it's very. It's near no, the UST uh, uh, hospital. Okay. Then uh, Shanti area B now houses uh, uh, the uh, graduate school no, of. Uh, uh, USD. Okay. okay, so continue. The camp had a total population of 3,785, mostly Americans and uh, British, with uh, some Australians, Canadians, and Dutch, and a few Polish, Norwegian, French, Spanish, Egyptian, uh, German, Swiss, and Slovak. The total number of shanties was placed at 683 with a population of 1,106 living in these uh, shanties. The newspaper also reports that a school of approximately 700 children and young adults operated with permission but no help from the Japanese. It was uh, staffed by qualified teachers in spite of grave lack of classroom uh, space and shortage of teachers and stationary. In terms of sanitary facilities, there were 36 showers for male and 33 for female uh, internees. There were 22 wash basins for male and 24 for female. There were 12 urinals for use by the male internees. So compare this with the, the total population of uh, the internees. So we have here okay, uh, a photograph of uh, female uh, internees washing their hair okay, in a common area, common wash area. Okay. So life in an internment camp was depressing. The separation of the internees from the outside world, especially their loved ones, was made more difficult by the problems of malnutrition, lack of sanitation facilities, and health problems inside the prison camp. A chronology of events in the camp is listed in three pages of uh, the newspaper. The list begins with the arrival of the first group of internees on January 4, 1942, and uh, ends with the liberation of the camp from the Japanese on February 4, 1945. The greatest challenge faced by the internees was the shortage in the supply of food and other necessities. This was discussed in detail in the diaries of two internees, Teresa Cates and Lucy Hardy Olsen. So we can find here no, a manifestation of how uh, malnourished the, uh, some of the internees uh, were. So we have here a photograph of five men liberated from the STIC. Uh, on February 23, 1945. From left to right, we have uh, Ari Hugo Winkler, 20, a, pro a proofreader on a Manila paper, uh, Manila newspaper, entered the, the camp weighing 135 pounds and left at 87 pounds no? on February 23, 1945. Next, we have Thomas B. Loft, a general foods uh, official who came in at 160 okay, 
And uh, on February 23, 1945, was uh, only 102 pounds. Arthur Williamson okay, weighed 145 okay, uh, when he entered the, the internment camp and uh, left the camp at 103 pounds. Harold uh, Lenny, once uh, 185, weighed uh, 105 pounds when he left the camp. And uh, lastly, we have David uh, Williamson, who weighed, uh, who used to weigh um, 145 pounds and left the internment camp at 100. And I'm sorry, uh, David Norvell, no, who dropped from 135 to 90 pounds. One of the categories of the archival collection of the UST uh, Digital Library is on uh, the internment camp. Yeah, it's collection six of the archival uh, uh, collection. Menus and the letters relating to life in the Santo Tomas internment camp are found in this uh, category. This includes the central kitchen menu composed of five pages. Uh, page three is uh, being uh, uh, shown here, where one can have an idea of what the internees had for nourishment. It can be observed through the menu that they were provided with only two meals per day, breakfast and dinner. One can notice that the internees had to take the same kind of breakfast every single day. Okay, so they had uh, cracked wheat, milk, coffee, sugar, uh, cream, and uh, rolls okay, on February 15. The following day, the same. The following day, or the next day, uh, the same. Okay, and uh, the days after, the same uh, uh, menu for breakfast. Okay. Dinner was a different story. Dinner served uh, varied from day to day and was noticeably uh, balanced. Okay, so uh, we have here, no, boiled chicken, rice, bananas, tea and rolls. Then the following day, mongo beans, chocolate uh, pudding, tea and rolls. The next day, uh, col uh, coleslaw, no? uh, pickles, fish, and uh, oranges, and so on and so forth. Okay, so fruits and vegetables were served alongside chicken or fish or meat and rice or roll every day. <clears throat> Another major challenge the internees had to deal with was the health conditions inside the camp. The journal article entitled I Nursed at Santo Tomas, Manila is a personal account of the nursing experiences of Dorothy Davis, registered nurse, at the Santo Tomas internment camp from January 1942 until she uh, boarded the exchange uh, ship 21 months later. Glimpses about everyday life in the camp can be seen through online uh, photographs and sketches such as the following. Okay, so this is a photograph they were anxious, confused uh, arrivals at the Santo Tomas uh, internment camp in 1942. Okay. According to uh, yeah, Robert Prissing, uh, note the frightened boy, this one on the right, okay, clinging to his mother. So this was a Jap uh, Japanese uh, photograph you know, uh, shared by Robin uh, uh, Prissing. Same uh, person, Robin Prissing, shared uh, another photograph, the you know, vegetable garden in front of the main uh, building of uh, the UST okay, around 1942. So poor soil and frequent floods permitted only roughage uh, greens like talinum, pechay, and kangkong. Okay? So according to uh, Prissing, they turned their backs to uh, 
the any Japanese uh, photographer. So another uh, photograph from uh, Robin Brising, the same patio in Santo Tomas uh, prison camp in 1945. You can see here men cooking at uh, sheds uh, in the shanty area. The papers of uh, Faye C. Bailey, an employee of the Manila branch of the New York City National Bank, and uh, his family <clears throat> who were interned in the camp provide further descriptions about the lives of the internees in the camp. Okay, so this was a pass that allowed uh, Faye uh, Bailey and his family to cook food in their shanty. In 1942, the Japanese allowed the internees to publish uh, journals and newspapers like uh, this one, the internities. Okay. Um, so th they were allowed no? uh, to publish this one. No? Uh, but the following year, it was no longer allowed. This is a sketch of uh, Caroline Bailey, daughter of Faye uh, Bailey. The stuffed bear uh, accompanied her uh, throughout her uh, stay in the camp. The letters found in the internment camp uh, category of the archival collection of the UST Digital Library provide clues about the anxieties of the uh, internees uh, regarding the conditions of their loved ones uh, who lived outside the camp. Okay, so the, uh, as of this writing, as of today, there are a total of 27 uh, letters of request addressed to the command, uh, commandant of the Santo Tomas internment camp. Okay, so these are uh, found in the archival collection of the UST uh, Digital uh, Library. These were written by the following uh, internees. So we have 27 names here. Uh, 27 entries, but actually 26 names no? because uh, entry number 24 and 25 are the same person with the two different letters. Um, the letter of request written by uh, Mr. Alfred uh, Farias represents the sentiments of the internees who were separated from their immediate families. Farias requested for the immediate uh, admission of his wife and uh, their two children as internees to the STIC. The request of other internees who wrote to the STIC uh, commandant was almost the same. The reasons stated by uh, Farias in his letter were very similar to those cited by the other internees. So let me uh, share uh, with you the contents of uh, Farias' uh, letter. Okay. So, Sir, at the Commandant, Santo Tomas Internment Camp, Manila, Philippine Islands. Sir, I urgently request that my family be admitted as internees to the Santo Tomas Internment Camp as soon as possible. My family consists of my wife, a Filipina, uh, Julia uh, Far uh, Farias, and my two children, Edwin, five, uh, five years, and uh, Pearl uh, Esther, one year. Okay. The reasons for my request are as follows. I have no resources or uh, funds to support my family on the outside. The family allowance uh, now received is insufficient to provide them food and shelter. If admitted, my children will be able to secure needed medical treatment, which I, uh, which is, uh, uh, I am, a, uh, uh, which I am unable to provide. Okay, so the the watermark here <laughs> makes it uh, difficult to read. Okay. Anyway, so. This was the letter of uh, Alfred uh, Farias. When you read the other letters, uh, uh, the content is almost the same. Okay. Uh, another letter of request was written by Mr. R. Rubilus. Uh, although it contains almost the same requests and reasons as those of Farias and the other internees, okay, 
what makes this letter unique was that it was handwritten by Rubilus himself. Over the last few weeks, there has been a dramatic decrease in the number of new and uh, decrease no, or decline no, in the number of new and active COVID-19 cases and deaths. Health experts and some uh, government leaders are optimistic that uh, COVID-19 is slowly becoming endemic, which means that it will uh, be more predictable and manageable. However, the fight against the coronavirus is far from over. As of this writing, there are still more than 41 million active COVID-19 cases in the world. In the Philippines, active cases total to more than 18,000. It will take a longer period of time before we can return to the practices that we are accustomed to. In conducting historical research, visits to libraries and archives will have to be minimized. This may be disheartening for some, but uh, the emergency situation due to the pandemic should not stifle us in our quest for more historical knowledge. Adjustments have to be made in order to adapt to the conditions of the time. It may be distressing at first, but it will be a thrilling experience in the long run. Perhaps the COVID-19 pandemic is a wake-up call for historians and teachers and students of history to look for alternative means of gathering uh, historical materials. Utilizing online resources readily available and easily accessible is one way of responding to the challenge. This presentation has been an attempt to move in that direction. This does not mean, however, that historians should altogether forget about going to the libraries and archives. The two practices complement each other. Recent developments give hope that the health crisis will soon be over and making visits to libraries and archives will once again be safe. That makes the future of historical research more exciting and inclusive as more historians will have a wider assortment of sources for their research. And with that, Raming Salamat. Thank you very much, Dr. Makapinlak, and we will see you again later for our open forum. For our second speaker for this morning, we have Mr. Jose Matthew P. Luga from the University of the Philippines, Baguio. Jose Matthew Luga finished his Master's of Arts in History from the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and his Bachelor of Arts in Social Sciences, major in history at the University of the Philippines, Baguio. His researches on the Japanese occupation of Baguio City have been presented in different international and national conferences, seen print in the Journal of Philippine Local History and Heritage, Saliksik e Journal, and as a conference proceeding in Shantog, mga kabundukan sa kasaysayan at kalinangang Pilipino. Currently, he is an assistant professor in history and NSTP coordinator of the University of the Philippines, Baguio. He is also a member of the Caloocan Historical and Cultural Studies Association. Once again, Mr. Jose Matthew P. Luga. Good day, everyone, and welcome to this uh, presentation. My presentation for today will be talking about Benguet, particularly the spice among us, espionage and counter-espionage in Northern Luzon during World War. So I am Jose Mati Luga, and I'm from the Department of History and Philosophy, the University of the Philippines, Baguio. So the outline of this presentation will be divided into four parts. First, the beginnings of the duel. When did the duel in this espionage and counter-espionage field began? The Lalo orders, which uh, dominated the mid-years of the espionage and counter-espionage duel. And finally, the, mount, the beginning of the guerrilla counteroffensive and how the 
counter espionage field has helped them mount such a, such a retaliation. And we will conclude by summarizing the presentation. The study of the Japanese occupation in the Philippines has oftentimes focused on the big events of the conflict, Bataan Death March, Corregidor, and the Battle of Leyte Gulf, or I also have, of course, the signing of the surrendered documents in Baguio City, September 3, September 3, 1945. Commemorating these events are important since they serve as important markers for the narrative of our liberation. However, an equal amount of attention should also be given to the events that occurred in between these markers. For it is this in-between events that actually give, give weight to these turning points. So the more significant the turning point, the greater the impact at the later courses, the later events in history. So we should also pay attention to such in-between accounts. One such lesser known in-between account during the Second World War was the duel between the United States Armed Forces in the Philippines, Northern Luzon, and the Japanese Army in the field of espionage and counter-espionage between 1942 and 1944. Using archival sources from the United States National Archives, which is digitized by the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office, the People's Court Papers from the University of the Philippines Diliman Archives, and other primary and secondary sources, this presentation shall present how Filipino and American forces were able to continue resisting the Japanese despite the loss of military advantage during 1942 to 1944. Emphasis will be directed towards periodizing the growth of this intelligence network, how the guerrillas and Japanese forces competed for the support of the local civilian population, and the significance of intelligence to the big events of the Second World War. In doing so, this paper hopes to surface the lives of some of our forgotten veterans who died with valor. So, similar. How the Japanese launched the opening attack, attack at Pearl Harbor, the Imperial Japanese Army was also respon responsible for beginning the duel in the field of espionage in the Philippines. As early as the 1920s, the Japanese forces had already begun sending spies to the country in order to assess the military strength of its troops. In addition to this, the, Jap the Japanese military actively recruited local Japanese businessmen in the Philippines to assist in their intelligence gathering. One such businessman, rumored to have worked under the Japanese military even before the war, was Toyohei Hayakawa, proprietor of the Japanese Bazaar and the past president of the Baguio Japanese Association. So this photo that I'm showing you is actually from... Um, from Enrique's, uh, from, from the book, The Memoirs of Baguio, and this is the stall, the Japanese Bazaar found at Session Road. Well, Toyohei Hayakawa is one of the rumored no, businessmen who served as, in, as, a, as a spy for the Japanese. But aside from Hayakawa, there are also rumors that some of the Japanese gardeners, farmers in the city of Baguio actually served as spies. So after, when the Japanese arrived in the city during wartime, many of the American businessmen who hired these Japanese gardeners were shocked or surprised to see that these uh, farmers or gardeners were actually a part of the army. So this is not just limited to businessmen. This is also, it's like open to all, it's like it's, uh, you can find a Japanese gardener who could have, could have actually been a spy. Now, using the information that the Japanese overseas agents gathered, the army was able to the Japanese army was able to launch a fairly accurate assault in the Philippines on December 8, 1941. The most famous assault of which was the bombing of Camp John A. So um, they, were, they were gathering information about the Philippine forces, about who are who's going to go for vacations in the city of Baguio. And there was a rumored report that Douglas MacArthur, 
the recently appointed general in charge of the USAFE would be uh, going to Baguio and would be uh, visiting this, the famous resort camp of Camp John Hay. And that was why um, Camp John Hay was one of the primary targets during the start of the war. In fact, at 7.25 a.m., uh, the camp was one of the earliest um, places in the country to be bombed. They hoped uh, to start the war by hitting MacArthur. But fortunately, MacArthur did not continue with his uh, supposed trip to Baguio. Nevertheless, as you can see in this photo that I'm showing you, this is a drawing no, of the condition of Camp John Hay during the Japanese occupation by Robert Hind, who is one of the foreigners interned during the occupation period. That's the band house was bombed. So many of the barracks in John Hay was uh, bombed by the Japanese. Um, MacArthur survived, but the camp was hit. In addition to that, Clark Field and Davao Gulf was also attacked. So the Philippine air defense was crippled in one fell swoop. So the opening salvo of the war was won partly through espionage. It was also through this intelligence that the Japanese attempted to quell other resistances that would continue in the Philippines during their occupation of the islands. So even though Bataan and Corredor was, uh, was the defense and the fall happened, uh, there were still small resistance groups or some guerrilla units fighting. Those that were trapped were not able to retreat to Bataan and Corredor or those who were unsurrendered who went to the mountains and started their own small units of resistances. For instance, you have Colonel Claude Armenius Thorpe of Yusafe Luzon Guerrilla Army Forces. You have Colonel Manuel P. Enriquez and Captain Guillermo Pinacar's 14th Army of the United States Service Cagayan Valley. Uh, United States Cagayan Valley. And Lieutenant Colonel Martin Moses and Arthur K. Nobles, US 5th NL, Mountain Province. So there were continued resistances despite the problem in Bataan and Corredor, and even after it fell, um, there were small pocket resistances happening. So in order to, in 1942, in order to deal with these guerrilla units, in order to deal with these resistances, the Japanese had to woo, had to, had to find the support of the civilian population, such as the creation of neighborhood associations that was used to, uh, the neighborhood associations were used to monitor the movements of the people in a barangay. And they were also used to identify who are those coming in, going out, and in the hopes of capturing the guerrillas. Now, another way to attract the Japan, the, to attract the Filipinos to turn over the American and Filipino evaders was to offer rewards of 5 to 50 pesos per evader. Uh, perhaps the most, uh, the most infamous of these uh, reports was how, Bal how, how Rufino Baldwin, one of the guerrilla leaders, one of, the, one of our Filipino guerrilla leaders, was actually betrayed by his fiancée over the reward money in April 1943. So this was effective no? to some extent. But should this be not enough, should this policy of attraction not work, the Japanese employed harsher means. The, this, were, this was now the paramilitary arm, where the paramilitary arm came in. So you have, of course, the, the bureau, the Japanese created Bureau of Constabulary, one of the, these arms the pro-Japanese political party GANAP, which was founded in 1939 as a continuation of the, Sakdal, the spirit of the Sakdal party, but eventually collaborated with the Japanese in 1942. And the most infa infamous being the, being the Makapili. Of course, the Kalipunan ng mga Pilipino on November 10, founded on November 10, 1944. So many of these paramilitary groups were involved in the Japanese practice known as zona or zoning, and this was implemented to limit guerrilla movements. 
and it's also this also a uh, popular story amongst uh, among the elder all the generation where you would wear a bayong or a basket in order to hide your identity fair makapili and just to point uh, individuals whom they would assume to be part of the guerrilla movement so such activity can be described as a raffle with torture and death throwing many communities into terror these counter guerrilla operations only gained momentum after the defeat of Bataan, April 9, 1942. Prior to its fall, many of the Philippine army units, uh, prior to this, prior to this fall, um, it was still, the Japanese still had a hard time dealing with them because they had to focus on defeating the formal resistance of Bataan and Corredor. And that was why um, it was only around the months of June and April Uh, June and July, when the Japanese military uh, was able to organize, train, and collect arms for its drive against the Northern Luzon guerrillas, limiting their counter guerrilla activities towards propaganda and espionage. Finally, towards the latter part of August, they began their raids, the, the Imperial Japanese Army, uh, against guerrilla occupied areas, forcing the Filipino-American guerrilla counteroffensive uh, in September to October. Unfortunately, with no other existing threat left to neutralize the zone, the Japanese were therefore free to send heavy reinforcements to northern Luzon. These Japanese raids, done in conjunction with intelligence gathering, resulted in the surrender of many of the guerrillas between November and December 1942. So it was only after the suffering, uh, on, on, only after suffering much losses against Japanese counter guerrilla intelligence network, that there was a need to there was a need to acknowledge this difficulty because the Japanese were now in control of both open warfare and because they're now able to freely direct their forces into quelling guerrilla movements, there was a need to lay low, to avoid being caught, to perfect organization and training, and to gather and transmit intelligence information as much as they could. So this is actually a snippet of the report of uh, of uh, Russell Volkman when he made the report about the activities of the USAFIP NL. So according to this report in February to in March 1943, um, the US FIP before it was uh, reorganized after the capture of Noble and Moses, um, the US FIP and NL were able to yet receive orders from the Southwest Pacific uh, Area Command to lay low, perfect organization and training, gather and transmit intelligence information and lay plans for future action against the enemy. And this, this was what the dictated much of the activity for 1943-1944. And that was also what the eventual Yusafip NL followed. So the Yusafip NL is a, is a reforming reorganization of the former Yusafip NL when Moses and Noble was captured on June 9, 1943. Since Russell Volkman was the next senior officer, he took charge and he reorganized it into uh, first seven district and later on into a five district command. And the following districts are the 6th Infantry, 121st, 15th, 11th, and 14th. And as I made mention, Volkman continued the general directive of intelligence gathering and avoidance of enemy contact. So this was a time, 1943 to 1944, was a time for our Filipino-American forces to hone their expertise, to develop their strategies in data ga in intelligence gathering, in counter-espionage technique. Because um, many of our soldiers were not trained in doing this, or were not, were not formally trained in counter-espionage tactics, In fact, there was a need to issue instructions during this time because they found how they found they were reading the reports 
that many of our Yusakip and El soldiers gave to be vague. That's why they had to issue these um, instructions. If you read this, so it's quite detailed. They give instructions on how to gather intelligence, how to gather, how to properly gather uh, data. For instance, let's uh, mention this. Do not give names. Use phrases instead, such as one of our men observed. Do not neglect to send information just because it is a rumor, but be sure to label it as such. So they, they are giving tips, directives on how to better identify information. My, my favorite here is this. Make information as complete as possible. Ask yourself, what things General MacArthur would like to know about an item? And include this in your report. So make, full, so make full use of all sources of information, loyal officials, workers in job bases. All, informations will, all information will be submitted. So these guidelines was eventually, thought, was eventually used and it did provide good results. If you are to look, for instance, at later reports, for Pangasinan, for instance, by the 14th Infantry Intelligence Courts, um, they would give a detailed map of where the garrisons are, where the Japanese garrison is, where ground embankment defenses are, where secret tunnels are, or where the trenches are. So it had an impact in the quality of information that eventually followed. And I think... One interesting element in the, in the order as well stated that our, our soldiers, our guerrillas, should make full use of all sources of information, which our soldiers did, particularly the women, women's auxiliary service. So it's not just the men who did the guerrilla, who did the intelligence gathering. It was also the women. The one such uh, Filipina agent was Josephine Abarba of the 12th Infantry Yusafip NL. So the way she gathered intelligence would be would be she would be by running messages and reports on enemy movements throughout northern Luzon, reaching localities such as Apari, Tugigarao, Bayumbong, and Nueva Vizcaya. In one instance. However, she was picked up by a local Japanese garrison in Cagayan due to the lack of a resident certificate. So she was actually stabbed at the leg. But fortunately, she was able to prove her to show a Japanese-issued pass. So, so she was let go. Now, to collect information, the women tried to provide and uh, tried to tried to gather inf intelligence from those from um, from, for instance, Jap from the Japanese who gave them truck rides. For instance, in the bars where the Japanese would flock. For instance, here at Pines Hotel, the Japanese during the occupation period would stay there and flock it. Now, some of the intelligence, the intelligence gathering women would go there and try to solicit information as discreetly as they could. So it could be because of their of their of their of their gender that they would seem to be let to be less as uh, suspicious compared to if it were men who would solicit such information. But the Japanese were able, did give such information to these uh, women. And they were eventually recognized for, for intelligence, as for this intelligence gathering as a specialty at which they became highly proficient. Of course, the most famous would be this uh, woman on, in this photo, who would be Magdalena Leones, and who also worked under, who on, who worked under Volkman. So using her former church connections as a former deaconess, she was able to acquire valuable information for the Yusafib forces. And her wartime actions merited her the Silver Star, making her the only woman in Yusafib NL to be awarded such a high 
U.S. decoration. So it's not just uh, the guerrilla forces, but also women who contributed in this intelligence gathering, even civilians. Uh, you have Ramon Mitra, for instance, who was, the, who, was a civilian, who was an assemblyman in Baguio, and later on, it's wartime mayor. He actually tried to insert guerrilla agents into the Relief Traders Limited um, Association in Baguio, which allowed many of the Benguet guerrillas to get, to get loot, um, loot, to loot mining materials such as dynamites for their use. So the likes of Abarva, Leones, and Mitra would show that the employment of civil, civilians as intelligence agents proved to be more efficient given that they could be more thorough, thoroughly trained as specialists, could move more freely, and could maintain themselves in longer, uh, could maintain themselves longer in an area without being detected by the Japanese. So, this does not mean, however, that we were we were the only ones who were successful during the 1943 to 1944 period. Unfortunately, the Japanese was also well aware that we were using civilian agents and that we were also trying to uh, use women in gathering information. So what best way to counter uh, the Filipinos than to hire one of their own? Of course, the most famous, uh, the most famous uh, Filipino Japanese, the Filipino hired Japanese spy would be spy would be Franco Vera Reyes. Or in one Japanese document, he was referred to as Franco Bera Risu. He came from a town of San, the town Santa Maria Bulacan, and prior to the war, he was a pop novelist and a licensed real estate. However, he was also known as a swindler because of his various estafa cases, with one of which being filed by the Lopez family. So given his background, Monetary compensation could have been the possible reason why he agreed to work for the Kempetai to gather information to identify the guerrilla forces and to track down the Filipino spies that are that we have during this period. The of course you have the he was able to actually. He was responsible to, for infiltrating Manila's underground resistance network. But um, you may not know, or people may not know this, but he also infiltrated the Baguio Intelligence Network. He was actually planted as uh, he was actually planted by the Japanese in Baguio, and he pretend, pretended to be he pretended to be uh, Bill Arthur. No, he used the the alias. Captain Bill Arthur, and he convinced one of the leading um, guerrilla units in Baguio during this time, Manuel Enriquez's Nakoko unit, and he convinced Enriquez to entrust to Arthur the list of the agents of, the, of this uh, intelligence unit because he claims to, be, to have connections to, to uh, Chick Parsons, no? who is uh, to Chick Parsons. So, Unfortunately, uh, Manuel Enriquez gave the list of the Nakoko unit, Nakoko Intelligence Unit of Baguio. So uh, it was it was unfortunate because the the group of Enriquez will find uh, will find out that Reyes was actually a spy because um, they were meeting um, Enriquez and Reyes. They were meeting. At the, at the Tropicana restaurant. That's where they meet, no? That's where they conduct their, their meetings. The restaurant was owned by, uh, I was, the restaurant, however, was in a conspicuous place. And Eugenio Lopez, who happened to be, who evacuated in Baguio, remember the Lopez family filed the case against Reyes. So they're familiar with Reyes and how he, and what he looks like. So once he saw, once they saw eye to eye, uh, once uh, Reyes saw Lopez and Lopez saw Reyes, Re uh, Reyes eventually immediately left the meeting 
and Lopez uh, Lopez was also assisting the civilian the civilian government here informed the Ramon Mitra who assisted the Nacoco intelligence unit that that's actually Franco Vera Reyes was a known swindler so his cover was blown so to cut the long story short Enriquez found out too late he already gave the list of uh, intelligence officers of his unit so the consequence was that they had to go to Manila to try and uh, to try and claim uh, to try and surrender so that they would not be executed but eventually him and many of the other members of the Enriquez guerrilla unit the Nacoco intelligence unit was executed because the amnesty program supposedly was already already lapsed because uh, Laurel issued an amnesty program but the amnesty program was al- already ended so they were executed somewhere at Fort McKinley on August 13, 1944. You win some, unfortunately, you lose some. So the guerrilla counteroffensive and the liberation of North of uh, of Luzon, 1944 to 1945, um, eventually gained momentum around the middle part of 1944. This was because there were impending reports of the return of the United States. So these developments led to a change in the general directive guiding the USAFIP forces. From laying low, they soon began launching limited attacks against paramilitary units such as the garrisons of the Bureau of Constabulary. So these ambuscades would later escalate to outright, um, outright raids to acquire ammunition, medicines, and radio supplies. Eventually, these similar equipments will also be provided by August 27, 1944, when the U.S. submarine Stingray landed at Bangi, Ilocos Norte. Now, with a established connection with the Southwest Pacific Area Command, HQ, they would receive um, new reports of an impending all-out offensive to be launched soon in northern zone. So to make way for this invasion, the use of FNL shifted its strategy from primarily avoiding enemy contact to focus on intelligence gathering to an aggressive disruption of Japanese defenses outlined in these following pointers. So the goal now was to make to uh, disrupt the transport network. That's why you can see they demolish bridges they destroyed communication. So the goal was to really uh, to really disrupt the Japanese defenses to make way for the eventual arrival of the American reinforcement. So these seven objectives that you see in this slide were adequately accomplished by the USAFIP units prior to the D-Day on January 9, 1945. Moreover, the five regiments, which I meant, which is shown in this previous slide, um, moved out from their mountain command posts into strategic positions in towns and barrios, which they have previously liberated from the Japanese, preventing them from regaining lost control of important uh, thoroughfares. Finally, the USAFIP units also provided intelligence. Inform me, uh, intelligence information regarding the defensive strength and location of the Japanese forces. If you look at the use of NL reports, they would state how many Japanese were at Cannon Road, how many Japanese forces were at Halsema Highway, how many Japanese forces were staying in the city proper. So these are some of the intelligence gathering that they continued to do, even though the day was now impending. So seven days before the American landing in Northern Zone, guerrilla reports estimated that there were around 85 to 90,000 Japanese troops stationed in the region, with heaviest density being concentrated in Baguio and its vicinity. As a result, Baguio became a prime target for American aerial bombing beginning February 1945. It was the March 15 March carpet bombing, however, that greatly devastated the city of Baguio. So, there, 
some citizens of the city, for instance, Oscar Lopez, who, who was here um, during the bombing, the Lopez family evacuated here. They have, they actually are they actually mentioned how the US Army intelligence, its serious flaw, was the bombing of the city. No? But if you look at the intelligence reports and if you look at the Japanese position in the city, there are actually, there are actually still some units located surrounding Baguio. And at, at Mount Mirador and Dominican Hill, these are important areas because of the height. No? It oversees this, the city. So they stayed there. So there was a reason why the Americans bombed the city and the information was supplied by the by the by the use of intelligence unit. So in conclusion, in conclusion, we have showed that using archival sources from the United States National Archive and People's Court Papers and other primary sources, um, the Filipino and American forces, though they surrendered so supposedly in Bataan and Corredor, resistance still continued. And this was through guerrilla units. It may not be outright, but it was also through espionage. So the Japanese started this duel. The Filipinos responded in 1942 to 1943 and to, 19, I mean, to 1944. The formerly divided Japanese forces, at the fall of Bataan and Corredor, they were able to focus their units in quelling our guerrilla units. That's why we focused on, get, on intelligence gathering. Around 1944, with hope of impending liberation, that strategy shifted from laying low to now outright um, disrupting Japanese bases and Japanese garrisons, still with an accompanied intelligence gathering. And we have also showed how important was the uh, contribution of other civilians, of other sectors of the site, such as the Women's Auxiliary Service, usually not, high, not, men not mentioned in the guerrilla warfare, but they did contribute to the defense or to the resistance during this period. And finally, it was also during this time that we were able to begin practicing our, or to further hone our experience in intelligence gathering. And it contributed to the successful D-Day landing of the U.S. forces of Je on January 9, 1945, and also in the eventual liberation of Baguio of April 27, 1945. So I think I can end my presentation there. Good day and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Luga. For our next speaker for this morning, we have Mr. Michael Anihelo Tabuyan from the University of the Philippines, Deleman. Mr. Michael Anihelo Tabuyan is currently a Humanities and Social Sciences faculty of the High School Unit of St. Scholastica's College, Manila. He received his AB in Political Science from Adamson University and is currently taking his MA in Philippine Studies majoring in Social Cultural Studies at the Asian Center, University of the Philippines, Diliman. He has taught several humanities and social science academic courses at the basic and tertiary education levels. Beyond his academic career, he is also the Director for Research and Education of Project SciSci Incorporated, a youth organization promoting popularization of Philippine history and culture. He is also a member of the Philippine Historical Association and the Kalookan Historical and Cultural Studies Association. Once again, Mr. Michael Anihelo Tabuya. So thank you. Uh, I would like to thank the Philippine Veterans okay. Affairs. Uh, I would like to thank the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office for inviting me to read, to give a lecture about the Lupa City during the Second World War in 1941 to 1945. So to start off, uh, let me tell you a story. Uh, in 2017, to commemorate the centennial of the restoration of their status as a municipality, 
the city government of Muntinlupa released a coffee table book titled Muntinlupa, isang daang taon na lakas, talino at buhay. Written to commemorate the city's centenary of independence, it presents Muntinlupa history up to the present time. It was seen as a follow-up on the earlier work on Muntinlupa local history written by Dr. Maria Luisa Camagay and published by the same local government unit in 2004. Despite this, it was evident in the two books that Muntinlupa's experience during the Second World War was not thoroughly discussed. This was despite the presence of several accounts that narrate wartime events in the town, especially in its new believed prisons. Thus, this research seeks to explore further the, the events in the city of Muntinlupa during World War II through the examination of various guerrilla reports available at the Pivao Philippine Archives Collection and other published works, it can be gleaned that the local community had contributed to the anti-Japanese resistance movement through intelligence work and provision of medical care and supplies to injured guerrillas and, citizens and civilians. It also shows that the success of the resistance movement in Muntinlupa was a combined effort among various guerrilla groups, the civilian population, and the civil servants employed in the various national government institutions in the city. So let us start now by, uh, by taking up uh, the context of Muntinlupa before the war. So Muntinlupa was still a sleepy municipality in the of the province of Rizal at the time when World War II broke out in 1941. Located at the shores of the Laguna de Bay, the town was the southernmost border of Rizal, south of which is the town of San Pedro Tunasan in Laguna. Then led by municipal mayor Pedro Idias, it was a town that heavily relies on agriculture as its economy. It was thus not surprising that the town was the location of various private estates, such as the Madrigal Estate owned by industrialist Vicente Madrigal, the Gaches Rancho owned by Magnet Samuel Gaches, and the Posadas Estate owned by former Manila City Mayor Juan Posadas. Likewise, the American period also saw the establishment of various government installations in the municipality. The town hosted the Department of Agriculture's Alabang Stock Farm, as well as the Serum Vaccine Laboratory, a medical installation owned by the Department of Health and managed by the University of the Philippines. Almost a year before the war began, the Department of Justice had just completed the transfer of the natural National Penitentiary from this old site in Manila to the newly built New Believed Prison in Barrio Poblacion. So this diagram shows now the location of the major sites in Muntinlupa during the pre-war days. The SVL, the stock farm, and the Madrigal Estate were all located at Barrio Alabang. This is shown here in numbers one, two, and three. Meanwhile, apart from hosting the town's municipal hall, Barangay Poblacion in its southern outskirts is the location of the new believed prisons, shown here in the map as number four. These sites would be, would be later the venue of the different events, major events that occurred in Muntinlupa during World War II. So at present, uh, only the, uh, the new believed prison still exists in its original form because uh, the Serum Vaccine Laboratory was later merged uh, to form the Research Institute for Tropical Medicine, and its building was later appropriated by, uh, by, uh, by a mall to be used as, uh, as part of their mall complex. Then Alabang Stock Farm was later, uh, was later developed uh, with the Department of Agriculture with, uh, under a joint venture agreement uh, with the Philinvest uh, Corporate uh, City to form the current day Philin Best City. Meanwhile, the Madrigal Estate was later developed as the, as the now Barangay Ayala, Alabang. Now, this slide now shows the some, the some of the key leaders of Muntinlupa upon the outbreak of the war. As what was mentioned earlier, Pedro Idias was the town's municipal mayor when the war started in 1941. A scion of a local prominent family, he was a former mayor of the town from 1925 to 1930 and was just re-elected after a long hiatus in politics. Meanwhile, Army Major Heriberto Mesa Senior leads, leads the then Bureau of Prisons as its director. An alumnus of the Philippine Military Academy, he was a career officer of the Philippine Constabulary before being assigned in the BUPRI. He was about to take command of the Philippine Army's 57th Infantry Regiment 
but President Manuel Quezon rescinded it and ordered him instead to stay at the Bupri. Lastly, lawyer Alfredo Bunyi was the superintendent of Montilupas Municipal. He was a former school teacher and uh, who transferred to the prison service as a civilian employee. From, from teaching prisoners, he rose on to its ranks to become the National Penitentiary Staff Administrator. He would later be appointed as Bupri Director by President Ramon Magsaysay from 1954 and serving up to 1958. And interestingly, he was the son of former Press Secretary Ignacio Muni, who also served as the town's uh, city mayor. So let us now see what happened in Muntinlupa upon the outbreak of the war. So upon the start of the World War II in the Philippines on December 8, 1941, Muntinlupa, together with other areas in South Luzon, was placed under the defense responsibility of the USAFE South Luzon Force of Brigadier General George Parker. Uh, maps indicate as well that the Muntinlupa was placed under the responsibility of the Philippine Army's 41st Division, led by General Vicente Lim. These events also prompted Director Misa to contact then Major Manuel Rojas to transmit to General Douglas MacArthur the services of NBP 6,000 prisoners and 200 armed prison guards for the defense of the town. While MacArthur declined this for safety reasons, obviously, he nevertheless accepted it, uh, the, uh, the offer of 1,000 prisoners to help in the labor work of the Philippine Army. Sadly, this was not implemented due to the Army's sudden retreat to Bataan. Notably as well, on December 27, 1941, a mass jailbreak was attempted by NBP prisoners as they were becoming fearful of the impending Japanese advance and the news of their killing spree. The SCPs burned two buildings and about 3,000 inmates ran from one side of the prison to the other as the prison guards fired in the air to dissuade them from climbing up the prison fence. Eventually, by morning, all prisoners had been accounted for and the fires had been put down by prison authorities. Luckily, no one was able to escape. Misa would deny this in a report published at the Tribune on January 1942. So, when the war plan orange was implemented, the USAFE troops in South Luzon passed through Muntinlupa on their way to Bataan. Their forces stayed in Alabang on December 29, 1941, after which they continued their eventual successful retreat. By December 31, 1941, the Japanese reached the borders of the town, prompting Japanese consular officials in Manila to meet the Imperial Japanese forces and ensure their orderly entrance to the town. By New Year's Day, Mayor Diaz would advise other towns to prepare for the Japanese arrival and, if possibly, disarm their police forces. Likewise, Misa sent then Prison Superintendent Alfredo Bunni and his son Guillermo Misa to meet the Japanese and talk them out of entering the new believed prisons. He then waited at their prison gates as an example to his subordinates and stood there waiting for the arrival of the Japanese and their subsequent fate. When the invaders arrived, he was ordered to stay in his, in his post and release the 80 Japanese insular prisoners incarcerated inside the new believed. The Japanese officials also stressed to him that he would be held liable for any misconduct of any prisoner who will try to escape. His son and, name, and namesake, future prisons director Heriberto Misa Jr. theorized that this unusual confidence that the Japanese shown to his father was because of this humane treatment of the Japanese internees in the early weeks of the war and maybe because his brother Guillermo studied uh, fisheries in Japan before the war. So, starting February 1942, the Japanese converted the NBP complex as a prisoner of war camp for both Filipinos and the Americans. To also secure the town, the historical data papers also noted that they also established a garrison called Gamachutay in Barrio Bayanan and also formed another one in Alabang. Its Filipino leadership and staff used the opportunity to help the POWs in giving, by, by giving medical aid to the victims of torture and allowed their families to visit them and be given food and illicit letters. Later, some of the prison employees joined the guerrilla movement while continuing their work in the prison. 
The Japanese occupation also brought suffering to the local populace. For instance, the Japanese seized the hidden fuel dump of the MVP after a former prisoner tipped about its existence. This resulted to transportation difficulties due to the lack of available gasoline. Likewise, they faced food shortage as the Japanese officials refused to adapt their necessary food rations. This prompted Director Misa to resist life by writing a letter to the Japanese Commander-in-Chief asserting their rations. While, the, while the Japanese officials responded to the, favorable, to the request in a favorable manner, they warned Misa not to repeat it in the future. The same problems were also ex experienced by other Muntinupa residents as the Japanese also confiscated their provisions such as livestock, grains, and poultry. They also loot properties from the locals with gusto and would not pay them at all. They, there were accounts that narrated how the Japanese would beat a POW inside MVP for even for the slightest mistake. Well, there, there were stories on how the Japanese are delightful in playing with children. There were also accounts which note that some children were also slapped by the Japanese for forgetting to bow to them. So speaking of the prisoners of war inside uh, the MVP, uh, this slide shows some of the notable uh, POWs inside MVP during World War II. So among them uh, were future senators uh, Jovito Salonga and Raul Manglabus and future Manila Archbishop Rufino Cardinal Santos. So in prison due to violation of military regulations, Salonga was brought to MVP in 1942. He would be pardoned in 1943 and after Afterward, stop the 1944 bar examinations alongside future Senator Jose W. Jokno. Later in life, he became a distinguished law educator, legislator, human rights advocate, and one-time presidential candidate. Santos was then a young priest when he was imprisoned in Bilibid for listening to enemy propaganda. He was, he was first incarcerated at Fort Santiago before being transferred in Montigupa. He would stay there until their liberation in 1945. After the war, he was elevated to the Episcopate, appointed Archbishop of Manila in 1953, and would later be the first Filipino cardinal. Manglapus, on the other hand, was a member of the guerrilla movement who was imprisoned in the NDP. He would later serve as one of the ringleaders of, of the successful POW jailbreak in Bilibid in August 1944. After the war, he became a legislator and later Secretary of Foreign Affairs. So this, uh, this intensive guerrilla activity and, this, and support from the local population made Muntinlupa a target of Japanese reprisals. Muntinlupa, together with other towns under the area of operations of the hunters ROTC guerrillas, were subjected to the intense zonification activities of the Japanese that led to the deaths of some civilians. The first wave, which happened around mid-1943, was a response from the assassination attempt by the guerrillas at, against President Jose P. Laurel. A year later, around late 1944, up to the town's liberation in February 1945, as the tide of the war turns unfavorably to the Japanese, another round of reprisals happened, this time in collaboration with the local Makapili. Details of these reprisals were documented even on the historical data papers and on the post for affidavits filed by the local residents. For instance, in Barrio Kupang, it was said that the Japanese rounded up all men in the locality and brought them in the vicinity of the Kupang Elementary School. Once there, they were machine gunned to death by the Japanese due to their suspected links with the guerrillas who had, who had a base in, uh, in the hill, hill, hill areas of the barangay. Even local officials were not spared Mayor Diaz was also arrested by the Japanese in late 1944 when they found out his links with the guerrillas, and he was never seen again. These events would later be the subject of investigations to which Superintendent Muni took part as one of the local investigators. So the occurrence of Japanese brutal acts Muntinlupa.
Misa likewise approved the secret reconditioning of radios in MVP for secret communications with the American submarines and the reception of uncensored news reports from the United States. These reports were, were then distributed to the local population for their information. The expansion of the Hunters ROTC guerrillas, which was formed in 1942, also reached Montinlupa when Baldomero Vinalon, a resident of Barrio Kupang, with the help of the gig based guerrillas led by Major Pete Bayani, established the Kanduli unit as a local branch of the Hunters unit in Montinlupa. Four months later, another, uh, another resident of Montinlupa, this time from Barrio Poblacion, Francisco Hilbuena, led the formation of another Hunters unit in southern Montinlupa, which became known as the Mangahan unit. Also known as the Bahay Kubo unit, this guerrilla group was composed of Montinlupa residents and some Bupre employees. So for operational purposes, the northern part of the town became the area of operations for the Kanduli unit, while the southern part, including the NDP, was given to the Bahay Kubo unit. These groups used the hills of Barrio Kupang and the hinterlands of the Madrigal Estate and, and the hidden interior of the Madrigal Estate as their command posts. They became highly immersed in intelligence gathering and roundup of suspected local Japanese collaborators. As these two guerrilla units were highly engaged in organizing Japanese resistance in the town, it's, it is not surprising that, that the Japanese subjected the town to stiff reprisals. So this slide shows the photos of Bandong Binalon and Pakingil Buena, the two local guerrilla leaders of Untinlupa and later municipal mayors. It was through their leadership that the units that these units contributed to the intelligence gathering activities of hunter of the hunters and the arrest of Japanese spies in the locality. Their units participated in, in the hunters' daring raid of the NDP on the midnight of June 25, 1944. The assault was planned for months and, prom and prompted the transfer of the hunters' headquarters in the Montinlupa Paranaque area. Initially postponed due to a false alarm, the raid became an astounding success when they rescued about 30 of their comrades and seized the weapons of the arm of the prison armory. The Mangahan unit troops became part of the raiding team and assisted in a prior intelligence gathering, while the Kanduli unit hauled the confiscated weapons and ammunition to their command post in Barrio Kupang. The success of this raid resulted to President Jose P. Laurel removing, reluctantly removing Director Misa from his possession as the Japanese wanted to execute him for what, ha for what happened. Likewise, um, Misa was replaced by a pro-Japanese official, um, Colonel Elias de Quino, and the guards were replaced by those coming from the government service troops of the Bureau of Constabulary. Months later, on the night of August 25, 1944, a group of prisoners led by Quintin Helidon, Raul Manglapus, Father Jaime Neri, Hermine Hindu Atienza, and Ernesto Tupas staged a mass jailbreak of POWs inside the MDT. Planned since November 1943, it was postponed because of the earlier believed raid. So preparations were done under the guise of late night choir practices and with the help of Bupri employees who provided them provisions for this escape. As the Panthers were still in the hot seat due to the earlier believed raid, the escapees were instead fetched by the Ernest guerrillas of Cavite at Paliparan, Las Marinas, Cavite. However, according to Kamagay, some of them were caught by the Japanese and later executed. So according to data, about 100 um, prisoners escaped from the NDP because of this trade, of this uh, mass, mass jailbreak. Meanwhile, this slide now shows the leadership of the Kanduli and Mangahan units of the Hunters ROTC guerrillas. Notably, the Mangahan unit's leadership was composed of some employees of the Bureau of Prisons. It was not surprising as some of Gilbuena's relatives were prison officials and employees during the war. Now, this slide shows the roster of the Women's Auxiliary Corps of the Mangahan and Kanduli units. So this shows that even women were part of the resist anti-Japanese resistance in Muntinlupa during the war. Their work units were used in intelligence gathering, supply provision, and medical care roles. Interestingly, the Mangahan work was, was led by an NDP physician 
Doctora Avelina Hilbuena Alcantara, who was the sister of Commander Paking Hilbuena. And his husband uh, was also a member of the uh, guerrilla unit. So the return of General Douglas MacArthur and his forces in October 1944 made all guerrilla units mobilized in preparation for the impending liberation. The same happened to the local guerrillas in Montinlupa who, cont who continued their activities despite the then ongoing zona against them. Upon the American landings in Nasugbu, Batangas, the Hunters GHQ transmitted immediate orders to its units to prepare their troops in participating in their, in their liberation efforts. The Hunters uh, 47th Regiment, 47th Division, were at peak of their preparations when they learned through a courier that the 511th Parachute Infantry Regiment of the 11th Airborne Division had arrived in Sapote on February 4. Vignalon then immediately went to Sapote on horseback and returned to verify the information. After this, Vignalon asked the permission of the sector commander, Major Atienza, to return to Muntinlupa with some of his troops to fight the trapped Japanese forces in his hometown. This thus started the process of liberating Muntinlupa on the same day, February 4, 1945. When this was accomplished, Vignalon was subsequently designated as the Provost Marshal General of the Hunter and of the Enter Hunters, and Hilbuena was appointed by the Philippine Civil Affairs Unit as the town's acting mayor. So the American landings made the Japanese in Bilibid restless, and thus on February 3, 1945, they started to execute military prisoners whose sentences are 15 years and above. The Mangahan unit fearing that any operation that would lead that they would do in relation to the executions would bring reprisals against the civilian residents of the reservation, decided to act humbly. Luckily, some military prisoners who were about to be executed were saved by prison physicians Mariano de Manlig and Bienvenido Alcantara by exchanging the names of the condemned with those POWs who had recently died in prison. Major Valdez's daughter, Elizabeth, also contributed to the rescue initiatives where she pleaded to the Japanese commander of the New Belibid, a certain Lieutenant Kojima, the lives of six American POWs who were about to be executed as well. The next day, February 5, the local hunters' units and the President Quezon's own guerrilla second corps area collaborated to liberate the prison. The Japanese, seeing that, the, that their enemies were just near the area, retreated from the prison and left it in control under Jukino. About 500 POWs were then released by the guerrilla forces and Jokino was subsequently arrested for his pro-Japan stance. Major Adriano Valdez, Jokino's deputy, who was secretly cooperating with the guerrillas, was then designated as acting prison's director. The Mangahan unit then went on to the tomb proper to assist the other guerrilla forces in, in the liberation campaign. Later on, both the Mangahan unit and the, PO, the PQOGs were stationed at the reservation. The Mangahan unit wax, led by Dr. Alcantara, offered to General MacArthur's guerrilla representative, Major J. Vanderpool, the usage of the NBP hospital as a military hospital for wounded Filipino and American forces. Thus, for the rest of, of the war, it was used for that function. With the, nurses, with the nurse aides of the Mangahan unit uh, rendering uh, medical services to the liberation forces. However, the Japanese attempted an assault at the NBP on February 6, 1945, on the same date that they decided to have a flag raising ceremony in the reservation. Coming from the eastern direction, about 80 Japanese troops were reported to be approaching the prison compound. The PKOG then engaged the Japanese and later retreated after after receiving three casualties. Another attempt was done on the following day, February 7, with the Japanese armed this time with mortars, rifles, and machine guns. However, this time, the PKOG was reinforced by hunters, guerrillas, and, uh, and uh, while, while, while they, uh, they had um, one casualty, they inflicted more casualties to the Japanese compared to the previous day. So after the liberation of the NBP, both the hunters and the PKOG used the NBP premises 
as their advance post for their subsequent campaigns. An agreement between the two groups were negotiated to ensure peace and order in the reservation trenches. They both joined the forces that retook the Serum Vaccine Laboratory at Alabang, Muntinlupa Rizal, and the encounter at the Sukat Mauling area at around late February to early March 1945. Some of them also joined the forces that liberated Fort McKinley from the Japanese. When the American prisoners at the Los Banos internment camp were rescued on February 23, 1945, the NBP reservation was also used as their evacuation area. Thus, the members of the Mangahan unit worked with the Americans in providing care and security for these liberated internees. So, after the war, President Sergio Osmeña reinstated Major Misa as director of prisons at around April. Misa then reiterated, then, then reinstated all employees of the prison service because of their proven loyalty, not only for the, to the country, but also to the cause of freedom. He likewise recommended the payment of the employee salaries in the period when the prison was under the guerrilla regime of the hunters ROTC guerrillas. Superintendent Bunyi, on the other hand, assisted the Commonwealth government in prosecuting Japanese collaborators by submitting to the office of the Solicitor General various affidavits from the relatives of the victims of Japanese reprisals in Lutinlupa and conducting as well investigations against the accused local perpetrators. Interestingly, his father, the elder Ignacio Buni, was among the victims of the Japanese reprisals in the early February 1945. Meanwhile, Barrio Alabang was used by the American and Philippine military as, as, a, as a camp. This camp was used as a site of the Philippine Army's Military Police Command Training School, which later became the, the post-war Philippine Constabulary. It was also used by the U.S. Army as one of their replacement depots. The NDP, meanwhile, reverted to its old status as the national prison and was concurrently used as a prison for Japanese prisoners of war and their Filipino collaborators. Some of the convicted POWs were even executed in its premises. Despite their wartime brutality, the NDP, then, then headed by Superintendent Buni, treated the Japanese POWs with compassion. Eventually, in 1953, the Japanese POWs were pardoned by President L.P. Giacchino, whose majority of family members were killed by the Japanese during the Battle of Manila in February 1945. At present, there are three local war memorials at NBC in Muntinlupa. Barangay Alabang hosts the Liwasa ng Mga Bayani, a plaza that commemorated the local guerrillas who contributed to the liberation of the, of the town. It was frequently used as a site of the city's liberation day commemorations every February 4. The NBP reservation in Barangay Poblacion also hosts two more memorials. First is the NBP Memorial Hill, which was also known to the locals as the Grotto which was initially built in 1949 as a burial site for Director Misa and features a 120 millimeter Japanese dual purpose gun. Sadly, this place was not well maintained by the prison officials, which prompted Misa's descendants to exhume his remains and transfer them to Davao last 2015. The other war memorial was the MBP Japanese Cemetery, built around 1971 by a group of Japanese civic leaders led by Sasakwa Ryochi, who was the president of the Chaban Shipbuilding Industry Foundation. And this monument was built to commemorate the Japanese prisoners who were executed there. The, uh, the erection of this memorial became possible after the negotiations with the prison leadership, presumably between either prison, between the terms of prison directors Alejo Santos, who himself was a guerrilla commander of the Bulacan military area, and former constabulary chief Vicente Raval. This led to some, some conspiracy theories that pointed out that the MBP reservation as one of the possible locations of the legendary Yamashita Gold. Apart from these memorials, um, it is interestingly to be noted that, um, that, Ped that Pedro Idias, the wartime mayor of Montinupa, was also commemorated when the former Montinupa Municipal High School was renamed after him in 1991, which is now called today as the Pedro Idias High School in, Barang in Barangay, Alabang. So both 
the MVP Memorial Hill and the Japanese Cemetery were declared by the city government of Montinlupa as their local historical sites. So um, with that, I would like now to end my presentation. I hope you learned a lot about uh, the local history of our town. Thank you very much and good morning. Thank you very much, Mr. Tabuyan. Ladies and gentlemen, this is where our morning session ends. The afternoon session will proceed at exactly 1 p.m., 1, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. While waiting, let us give you a virtual tour of our National Military Shrine. So just a quick reminder uh, for our participants, you may now send in your questions and we will address them later during our open forum. Welcome to the historic Lusakit NL Military Shrine Park located in Darigayas, Lina, Naumia. United States.